And there's no way that uh, this small group of uh, roundtable speakers could really represent, you know, Barry's uh, rich uh, intellectual um, and professional legacy. I think he deserves to have uh, a separate uh, conference, two or three days conference to really honor and celebrate uh, Professor Barry Gill's work. But uh, I'm not a speaker of this part, so I'm very happy that uh, that Professor Franklin Obing Odom has decided to uh, chair and also act as moderator of, uh, of uh, Barry Gill's uh, keynote uh, lecture. And then afterwards, Barry's the, uh, round table. Well, we gonna honor Barry. So to introduce Professor Barry Gills, uh, I'm calling on uh, uh, Professor uh, Franklin Obeng Odom. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, Many thanks, uh, Bon. Um, our distinguished speaker today uh, is something too short. Huh? <laughs> our distinguished uh, speaker, our first keynote address, um, keynote speaker today, is something of a maverick in development studies, a field which is currently like a broken mirror. He is against both the highly influential development economics, often seen as the orthodoxy, <clears throat> and against the fairy post-development alternative um, that paints everything before it as the problem. The orthodoxy recurrently uh, sees the lack of growth as the problem. The alternative sees both the attainment of growth and development as egregiously wrong. The professors in the orthodoxy show academic snobbery. Those in the heterodoxy contemplate class suicide. Theatrics, which are soft spoken, distinguished lecturer, strongly um, opposes. But it is not even clear whether this so-called um, heterodoxy or heterodox challenge is all for show, much like how the poor in Indonesia recite poetry about horrendous conditions in which they live for empathy and charity. Our surveys upon surveys show uh, that public trust in economists is only higher than crooked, um, than trust in crooked uh, politicians. Um, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, winners of the Nobel Prize for their work in development economics, propose an answer that they say is mega. Make economics great again. Our speaker is still unfazed, mainly because his primary concern is the lack of holistic historical methodology. The mainstream failed um, experimental approaches and emphasis on how free and big money can do the job of development quickly amplify the contradictions in the field and I intend no pun. But is the post-development alternative and its contention to euthanize development any historically sound? Johanny Koponen, an historian of development, points out that not only is the post-development characterization ahistorical, its history of the field is both quote, invented and shallow, unquote. In his lifetime, Herman Daly, the eminent ecological economist, agreed, but offered another ahistorical claim. Quote, the problem is growth. 
not development, unquote. And yet, degrowth and post-development have become omnipresent phonetically and fanatically. The themes in one recent conference graphically illustrate this fanfare. Feminist political ecology and degrowth. Decoloniality and degrowth. Anarchism and degrowth. Rural and urban dialogues on degrowth. Green New Deals and degrowth. Cultural politics of degrowth. Embodying degrowth. Social movements and degrowth. All pressing and present challenges, no doubt, but our keynote speaker would probably question how sustainable is a species that forgets its past. The critique that capitalism is the problem is, of course, historical. But the world did not begin with capitalism or neoliberalism. These are quite recent compared to, say, imperialism, whose theories are rather distinct. In the words of Fernand Brodel, an, historian, an historical approach must be, and I quote, the sum of all possible histories, those of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, unquote. This holistic approach to development is precisely what is needed, but it is exactly what is usually neglected, except, of course, in the works of Barry Gills our distinguished speaker, who once observed, and I quote, ideally, we should study world development as something that has been going on for centuries, if not millennia. It is a central matter from a methodological perspective. Everything depends on it, unquote. Barry Gill's is currently the most senior professor of global development studies, um, not only at the University of Helsinki, but also in Finland, literally and figuratively. Before coming to Helsinki, Gills worked as professor of global politics at Newcastle University and as the director of the Globalization Research Center at the University of Hawaii. He has worked in three pivotal areas world system theory, globalizations, and the historical approach to ecological development, areas in which he has authored, co-authored, or edited more than 20 books. Simultaneously, he has spread his rebellion by helping to publish more than 100 books in his book series. Most social scientists are ignored, not Professor Gills. His work has been vigorously engaged, making him one of the most cited scholars in both development studies and the social sciences more widely, nationally and globally. Academia aside, the media has been obsessed with what Professor Gills has to say. Journalists' requests for interviews, media mentions, and media rankings cement Professor Gills' standing as one of the most serious public intellectuals of our time. As fundamentally still is Professor Gill's leadership of and service to the field, not only as a scholar, but also as an institutional builder, teacher, and mentor. He's, co he's a co-founder of the World Historical Systems Theory Group of the International Studies Association, uh, the sole founding editor and editor-in-chief of the academic journal Globalizations, the sole founding and co-book uh, series editor of Rethinking uh, Globalizations, and co-founding member of Exalt, um, the Global Extractivisms and Alternatives Initiative. Recognized with the International Studies Association, Association's James N. Rosnow Award, election to the World Academy of Art and Science, and best international teacher, Professor Gills is clearly primus inter Paris. But 
like all rebels, girls has also uh, been the subject of much criticism, some of which are frankly pokus pokus. A reminder of what Daniel Raymond uh, noted in his 1820 treatise, Thoughts on Political Economy. Quote, although his theory is founded upon the principles of nature, and although it is impossible to discover any flaws in his reasoning, yet the mind instinctively revolts at the conclusions to which he conducts it, and we are disposed to reject the theory even though we could give no good grounds." Unquote. This sort of criticism must be dismissed, not only because it offers nothing to discuss, but also because as J.M. Keynes noted in the preface of his general theory of employment, interest and money, quote, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones, unquote. But other criticisms need answers. Has Professor Gills dragged development studies too much into ecological concerns, sidelining traditional development issues? Under his watch, has development studies become too eclectic, uh, such that development research is everything with whatever methodologies and therefore the study of nothing? And are there apparent inconsistencies between a one world system where no economic system must be privileged uh, and Gill's persistent emphasis on capitalism uh, in his work? Professor Gills has successfully debated André Gunder Frank, a scholar whose interpersonal relations Emmanuel Wallerstein euphemistically described as, quote, notoriously difficult debated whether the world system must be spelt with or without a hyphen, and debated whether the world system is 500 or 5,000 years old. But can he address these three big questions? Or is it even fair to pose these questions to one person? Walter Rodney, the great Guyanese political economist, once noted that, quote, responsibility in matters of these sorts is always collective, unquote. So to address these uh, questions is an excellent panel constituted by Walden Bello, uh, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of the Philippines, Kevin Gray, Professor of International Relations at Sussex University, S.A. Hamed Husseini, Senior Lecturer in Sociology at the University of Newcastle, uh, Don Marshall, Professor of Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, Jamie Morgan, Professor of Economics, uh, Leeds uh, Beckett University, and uh, our own uh, Anya Newgren, Professor of Global Development Studies at uh, University of Helsinki, and our own Antti Tyvan, and doctoral scholar uh, in Global Development Studies here at the University of uh, Helsinki. But first, please join me in welcoming Professor Gills, to set out his life in development studies. Well, <laughs> as ever, you are too generous and, and also rightly astute and critical uh, to sort of he didn't come to praise but also you know to challenge that's good uh, I want to I should and it is it is important protocol to, to give heartfelt thanks to everyone who organized this for me and invited me all the panelists in particular the co-organizers here Bon, Franklin everyone Tina and all my colleagues and friends uh, and my family, um, because this isn't about me, um, this is about us. And I wouldn't have been able to do anything um, without the help of my colleagues. So, okay. Um, the title of this, I, 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 we sort of put out the, the message that this is Reflections 
and 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 that's what it is. And I, I have been reflecting, <laughs> and um, remembering, and uh, recommitting uh, for for many weeks now. Uh, it, it has been in my mind to compose this. So, um, a, about the title, uh, a life or life in development, a life in development, which are the same. They cannot be separated. Um, and so all life is in development, uh, in a lowercase d, this is clear. Uh, and each of our own lives is lived in a context of an organizing principle or concept we call development with an uppercase. And that is inescapable. We are, we are born into these conditions historically, both collectively and individually. So we, there is life in development and a life in development for us, for us all, individually and collectively. And each life, a life, is a, is a unique experience despite the structural conditions. And so uh, the themes I'm going to address um, in broad ways, as much as I am able today, are the relationships and method in this field, or my reflections on understanding through time, history, and process, and how they relate methodologically. So I'm going to start, perhaps unusually, with invoking Tolstoy and Brodel. Franklin said there was an oddity in my work that I've never cited Brodel. And I said, oh, that's true. <laughs> Although I, I read, you know, the, uh, the Mediterranean world and the age of Philip II, uh, civilization and capitalism. Uh, you know, I, I read and uh, admired Brodel and, of course, the lineages of Brodel and the Brodel Center and so on. But I never cited him. It's true. But then... I had already decided to use Brodel today before you pointed that out to me. So it's right here in <laughs> she. So Tolstoy and Brodel, why, why them on the framing of life and time and history and process? So Tolstoy, my, my dear friend Boris Kagerlitsky in Russia, who is now in prison, uh, a military tribunal decided on Tuesday to send him to prison for five years, we all believe it's po politically motivated and for his opposition to the war in Ukraine. But he told me many years ago that during the Soviet era, uh, he's been imprisoned by every regime since Brezhnev, by the way, <laughs> in Russia. <laughs> and he's quite, makes quite good jokes about it. But um, he said that the, the people honored Tolstoy as their inner life in, in the Soviet time. What did he mean? Well, for example, in War and Peace, there are three lifescapes that we all is experience. Um, and the first is the great external events of the world uh, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a huge canvas, uh, monumental, tumultuous, immense, unavoidable, but external. You, I, we don't have control over them. Well, or, or almost none. <laughs> we must experience them. And every lifetime, they happen. And then there is the sort of sphere of the personal life world. Our, our, our own relationships, uh, all the encounters we make, all the mentors we have, all the loves and friends and colleagues and the work we do, purpose we have. That, in that sphere, we have some choice. We are, we are constrained by conditions, but we have, we have choices, and they have consequences. We build that. And the final one is the inner life, which is where we only ourselves alone live that. As we are born and as we die, it is only us. And, but in that inner life, there's the most profound source of meaning and of strength, of purpose, of understanding. We have to cultivate it, otherwise it might languish. But it is all important, all important. And we live in all three simultaneously in every life. And so that's also life in development. Um, but it depends on how we engage, each of us, how we choose to engage with these lifescapes. 
That is, uh, that is for us to decide. And on Brodel, to combine Tolstoy with Brodel, I mean, his, his framings of historical time are well known, and many of my colleagues in the past educated me in terms of how they would deploy them in international political economy. Uh, I, I think the essential contrast he is making is between in what might call, be called deep historical time and structures and processes and transient momentary um, appearances and moments, events, both of which exist, <clears throat> but we need to differentiate them and understand their relation to each other and our response and engagement with them. So Brodel frames history in these timescapes and if the very well-known long durée, of which, of course, I'm most attracted. <laughs> and maybe my long is longer than, than some others. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's a scape in which great structures of history, if you want to call them that, or historical social systems, uh, have their history over many centuries or even in millennia. And that would that include, for example, looking at civilizations or historical social systems or capitalism uh, in its origins, apogee, and demise. Uh, and then there's a kind of um, intermediate time in which you can see the playing out of particular junctures. Uh, and, and, and where you can, you can, in a lifetime, you can see playing out of a particular pattern, a process, a phase, a cycle um, in, in historical time as you experience it. And then there are the events, which are ongoing, lived experience, moments, flashes, constant, perpetual, um, immediate lived experience. Um, and so, again, there are the three, the three escapes are all in one, as with Tolstoy. And then I'm putting Tolstoy and Brodel together to say, I think this helps me understand, as I've been reflecting, life in development and a life in development, played out through these six scapes together, both individually and collectively, socially, historically, for myself and for us all. Because we are each born into a very particular time, and we are born into very particular historical conditions. Um, each and every one of us in our time, and these have historical potentialities, uh, their own contradictions, their own possibilities, uh, and there are also critical junctures um, or inflection points historically in these, in our lifetime, where the balance of forces within a given socio-historical structure shows a precipitate moment of potentiality the potentiality is to alter the historical direction and the substance of the existing social order. These are what I call critical junctures, and they are of the greatest importance, both analytically, theoretically, and practically, to which we are compelled to respond. Uh, so my late friend, and my dear friend and mentor, Gunder Frank, who was writing in the early 1960s, uh, laid out the task for development studies as he saw it in his time, but for the future. I think um, it, you might see its relevance. He says, this reality of capitalism, of its contradictions, development and underdevelopment, impose on us important tasks of scientific theory and research and of political strategy and tactics. We must formulate scientific theory capable of encompassing and explaining the nature, contradictions, historical development, and underdevelopment of this whole worldwide process and system as a whole. And we must pursue research which is designed and adequate for formulating such theory. Well put, Gundi. And so it, I think I, I feel compelled to say that uh, we, we are morally called upon in our life and development, historically, to stand with the oppressed wherever we find them. 
and if not, then to be complicit in their oppression and their suffering. To stand with them, to be with them, to walk with them, and to learn from them, and also to be led by them is most important. Uh, and it makes us more humble uh, and perhaps closer to reality outside of our privileged conditions that many of us are born into. Uh, and so what, how did I come to this field myself? Uh, I entered university as a young fellow in 1974, and I began to study the non-Western world, its arts, philosophy, history, the lot. Um, at, I, was, I was immediately fascinated by non non-Eurocentric <laughs> knowledge. Uh, I wanted to seek enlightenment there and understanding. So, uh, but when I did that, uh, when I started to do that, and the more I did it uh, for a few years there in the 70s, uh, the, you, I came to a kind of, I don't know, awakening, a realization, which, but through experience, you come to this conscientization if you make the effort. Because it's there. And that was that the world had been shaped by centuries. The world I was living in and what was happening in the world at that time when I was awakening uh, was the product of centuries of brut brutal violence, conquest. Uh, it's, it's unimaginable in its horror. And it's, you know, we call it colonialism, uh, imperialism. Capitalist modernity, very many words it goes by, but it's unfathomable to us in its violence. And the, 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 the degree to which it embedded into global history and global society that we, that we are born into is, is, is inestimably great. So I, I realized this and I went, well, I need to, this is so vital, so central to everything. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to go there. I'm going to study and study and study and study. So I did. And um, at the same time, uh, it was already apparent to me, and not only me, but many people at that very time, that, oh, oh, uh, the trajectory that our civilization is on is potentially catastrophic. Why? Because humanity has, has decided to treat all other life in the life domain of the planet uh, through objectification. It's not sacred, it's not living. Uh, it, these are things to be manipulated and destroyed for our desires. And it, it had gotten already so out of control and the trajectories were so clear. And, 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 and like many in my generation, I read The Limits to Growth and I read the uh, reports of the Club of Rome and I. I read uh, various other things around that, Ivan Illich and various things you read uh, in those days. And you, 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 you go, all right, it's coming. And so there's, I, 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 I need to engage with that. I will be aware of that. Although I have to say that for a very long time, I wasn't very aware of it in my work because I became so fixated on uh, what I had learned in international political economy uh, and as a political economist, you kind of there's a temptation to just stray over to become more and more an economist. <laughs> no offense to economists, although my mentor Susan Strange, the late professor of international political economy at the LSE, she used to say to us uh, students, "Always attack the economists." <laughs> and and anyway, you know that's that that's what we do. And, uh, and there's plenty to criticize uh, that, that, that uh, they don't sufficiently understand the political in the economic uh, and, that's, and the social theory that seems to be lacking and the historiography it seems to be, that, you know, there's plenty for us to, uh, to criticize. So enjoy it, embrace it. So I did. Um, so the, this has to do with intentions uh, and purpose and our own meaning making, because in academia, we are actually engaged in the construction of knowledge, but also meaning making for ourselves, for our students, for society, for history. 
and it's recorded. And it, it matters because, as Hadley Bull used to say, thinking is research too. Thought is action. It is not non-action. So we should never underestimate what we do or the importance of knowledge construction and the debate over the most essential and important future determining ideas of our time. That's extraordinarily important. And we have to take it with all the seriousness it deserves and the commitment it deserves. So, you know, I was saying that when we go through this, there is, there's one thing I have learned and I, that, and I, that I uh, want to apologize for or, or, or anyway uh, admonish you to avoid is that uh, one of the problems with being in academia is the professionalization of your role and your knowledge and the instrumentalization of it. And then how you have to struggle in the particular structures, very uh, uh, constraining ones, to succeed and to survive and to flourish there. And that isn't easy, it's very difficult. But sometimes outsiders don't understand how immensely competitive academia is uh, at, at all times. And so that, that is an immense existential pressure. So professionalization can, also, can be a trap, or you lose sight of your original moral purpose and intention, and the, 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 the means become the end, and an end in themselves, which is that I will succeed, I will succeed, I will succeed. Ah, don't go there. I've been there, and it made me miserable. And I've seen other colleagues that have the same. And this is about life, our life, and our inner life. Never, you must always go back and cultivate that inner life and find there your renewal, your memory, and your recommitment to your original intention, your moral purpose, and the, and the meaning of this moral purpose. If you lose sight of that, I would say you're lost. And you don't want to be consumed by the conventional system, despite the fact that you need to survive and you need to succeed. It's not an easy one, but you must remain ever mindful of it, because if you go too far, it, it, you'll suffer, and your work will suffer, and those you work with and around you will suffer. So enough about that. So uh, conjunctures, pivotal inflection points in, in my lifetime, in my life in development, what, what, yeah, I was, I, so what are they? I wanted to identify, what are they? Um, so I was born into, I was a child of the 60s. You know, I was in the you know, sort of late 60s. And, um, you know, that, there's a time of anti-colonial struggles for national liberation, wars, many wars, huge struggles, vast canvas. And this was all around us. And then so many articulate, brilliant, eloquent thinkers from the, from these movements, and you start to encounter them, you start to read them, you know, see, see the world from their point of view. So that was there, and, and then the, the sense of rebellion in the late 60s, you know, and that the possibilities of the alternatives of a whole new world, a whole new civilization, kind of showing, could we finally break out of the, the cons, con, constraining factors of the state and class society and capitalism and war and imperialism, and colonialism? Can we do this? We must do this. It's a dream, imagining it. Hmm? So uh, that's the first one. Then comes uh, the counter movement, the uh, Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States in Mexico in '74, reclaiming that the uh, natural resources of the whole of the colonized world that these are ours. They don't. They don't belong to your multinational corporations and your banks. They belong to us, and we reassert the right that they belong to us. Because if, if we cannot control them, then we cannot develop. We cannot overcome the legacies of underdevelopment and poverty, illiteracy, and oppression unless we have this. So the fight was on. And the new international economic order, which spoke out, the Group of 77, the non-aligned movement, saying the post-World War order may have been a settlement amongst certain great powers to establish their hegemony, and, the, you know, and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we, we regard the whole edifice of the rules as being systematically biased to disadvantage us, which, by the way, I agreed with and still agree with. 
Uh, and that, his, that movement had its own history and was uh, sort of unilaterally vetoed by uh, the Reagan Thatcher Entente and then the uh, increase of uh, uh, interest rates globally uh, and the debt, the debt, the next inflection, the debt crisis and structural adjustment, the last decade in the continent of Africa, the uh, the the IMF became becoming what we used to call it the world's most powerful political agency because it could intervene directly in the so-called sovereignty of so many independent or nominally independent and sovereign states. No other entity seemed more powerful than the IMF in those years. And so the next was the, the that led to directly um, the globalization of neoliberalism, uh, what uh, we called neoliberal economic globalization, um, which would be, you know, was a whole new assault against uh, all the uh, social responses of social protection aimed at uh, trying to overcome those many unfair advantages of the North uh, and, and sweeping them all away for the transnationalization of capital and capital accumulation on a world scale without fetters. Without fetters. Uh, and that was promised as a telos, as a teleology of development. The same liberal promise they've been making ever since liberalism was invented in which Carl Polanyi critiqued so, so brilliantly. Um, that brought about that dismantling of all the protective measures on the globe in, in order to facilitate the transnationalization of mobile capital brought about the global financial crisis, despite the fact that certain economists had gotten a Nobel Prize for saying that they had eliminated systemic risk and there would be no more great systemic crises. Boom and bust was over. It was solved. There was equilibrium. There was stability. All, all false. There wasn't real world economics. It was just a, a ideology uh, posing as scientific theory. Because the proof of the pudding, theoretically, as Fred Halliday used to say, is in the eating. So either uh, you know there's something wrong with the facts, or there's something wrong with your theory. When everything goes the opposite, and you all said that was impossible, well then so something's wrong somewhere. And I think it's in the theories or ideology. But that, that could have gone many different ways. That's why they're, in, that's why they're conjunctures and inflection points. Then, then you might add the COVID, the global COVID crisis, because again, people have the aspiration that it could be transformatory. And then you see how it actually played out and revealed the embedded asymmetries, inequalities, and oppressions in the system as it's already and still perpetuating and existing as it is. Then, but there were yet many elements of transformatory potentiality in the COVID crisis and its aftermath. And then now we come to the present conjunctures, which is a com combination. The cumulative global climate change and ecological crisis. I, I, I don't wish to belabor these crises today, uh, but we are all aware of that one <laughs> and uh, how close we are to the tipping points and the interaction of the tipping points. It is truly frightening. Not that it was not anticipated for the past 50 years, because it was. It has been. It is. We have knowledge of this. And then there is the, the kind of replaying uh, of the counter-hegemonic uh, realignment of the global south to challenge the north, which you see playing out before you at daily news feed about the BRICS and the expansion of the BRICS, the de-dollarization efforts, the buying of gold, the many uh, ways in which this challenge is being launched once again at elite intergovernmental level at the state system, whilst of course you could then lose sight of the, of the uh, uncountable social movements around the planet who <laughs> also exercising agency and transnationalism. To, trans, to challenge and transform their life world and even the system. So never lose sight of that. They're happening simultaneously, but it is like in a way full circle. Now we're back to geoeconomic, geostrategic rivalry, fragmentations, innumerable conflicts and violence. As Mary Caldor wrote about old wars and new wars, the old, the old wars are you know, the interstate fight you know, the big armies and the classical war under the rules of war. But the, that's kind of passe 
in a way. And these wars are fluid and diverse, diffused, many, many social actors, many, many militias, many, many, all, all kinds of mess. And they're perpetual. I mean, look at the history of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Just one example. Or Myanmar. That there are so many. Afghanistan. There are many. Yeah, and this has become very worryingly widespread. So that's all part of this, what's happening at this, at this particular conjuncture. So our work tracks these, uh, these crises, these multiple crises. Uh, and what do we do? We, can, we have choices. We can describe, we can measure observable facts, data, events, patterns, processes. That's empirical, you know. And of course, the empirical is very impoverished if it isn't driven by the theoretical and the rigorously conceptual, where the real action intellectually, I would argue, is and must be. Uh, but we also engage in imagining and theorizing, uh, both in terms of the causation of those patterns that we measure, uh, but also their alternatives. Because if you, you know, it's like uh, alternative history. Uh, what if, you know, the big, the big what ifs, like the, that the history as we measured it and we've seen it and said observable wasn't the only inevitable one. There were many, many, many other possibilities. Some of it is contingent on chance even. Or one single precipitate event that changes, to, but they are not inevitable. That's determinism. And we shouldn't use deterministic analysis, we should avoid it. Got to keep that fluidity of agency with structure open, always open, always open, and aware of it. Um, so imagining and theorizing radical alternatives is, in my view, an essential part of global development studies at all times. Not simply describing the existing system and critically analyzing it and criticizing it. That's, that's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, and then there's the study of deep structures, deep history, um, and the causal mechanisms, the causal mechanisms of structures and systems that we are part of the conditions in which we are born, in which we live, in which to which we respond, engage with, either internalize or try to re rebel and change. So there are causation processes that emanate from the historical structures themselves. You might say that the current climate crisis and ecological crisis are one of those. The ultimate causation is there in the structures and the system itself, arguably. Yes. And then you, so you look for what uh, Hamid Husseini and I, my dear Hamid friend, we're calling infra processes. We're going to go go a bit into the deeper analysis of these socio-historical structures, and things like reification as an infra process for commodification. And the commodification is tied in historically with uh, the decommoning of life spheres and the capitalist value creation, which then becomes normalized as value itself. The only value that has value is capitalist value. Now, that's wrong. Fundamentally anti-human. <laughs> uh, and that's all to you know, lead on to the accumulation of capital and the accumulation of capital as a dominant governing force in history, which I argue it is. It has become the empire of capital aided by the state. Uh, but then, what does it all lead to, to? What do I think I've arrived at methodologically? Well, I think it's uh, historical analysis, yes. But it's historical dialectical analysis. I've come to see all these as contending social forces. And those contending social forces are mirrored or manifest in, in social processes. And then you see the contending social processes and the contending forms in the social processes between, yes, capital and labor, of course, capital and oikos, we call it, or commoning and decommoning 
recommoning, the creation of what we call Hamadanide, true value outside capitalist social relations, which is essential to all human life and all life, and capitalist value, which is very narrow and very restricted and often very destructive of humanity. And then we see that in the crises that we're experiencing, how destructive it is, capitalist value, that is. So I'll just have a bit more. Talking about, I sent out a, a little bit of uh, indication about this lecture that we talk about linear progress, question mark, or perpetual crisis, question mark. And I just want to, or permanent crisis, of the poly crisis. And I wanted to comment that uh, I don't see this as a choice. I see it as a simultaneity and a unity. I'm not going to deny that there's linear progress. I mean, there's linear progress in all kinds of ways that you can measure and people do. If they emphasize only the linear progress, then they become Dr. Pandloss. You know, you're living in the best of all possible worlds, no matter how absurd and how horrid and violent it is. It's still the best of all possible worlds, says Candide. Yes? Well, that's a bit... It's not very good scientific theory, is it? So much of what we call development is actually maldevelopment, and, and it is intrinsically so. For example, just a quick example. You cut down on a massive rainforest and all the life that represents, and you grow some grass and you have some cattle there. Now, in terms of GDP, that was progress. Uh, you increased the GDP, you increased your revenues, you increased the export, to, uh, better for the balance of payments, all, all good, all positive, only it's not, it's a catastrophe. It's negative value. And that's the truth. So why doesn't the economic paradigm say that? Well, it should, it must, it has to. That's the root of our problem, that it doesn't, or it hasn't, or still insufficiently. This is just bad economics. Attack the economists. Attack their orthodoxy, yes, because they're wrong. And that's what academia is. We're supposed to do that. Debate, 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 debate. Refute your opponent and, and refine your own argument and work with your colleagues in a school of correspondence to create a school of thought because there's more power there. Right? That's what we do. And let's do it. So I see all of this as a dialectical interplay historically. Yes, there's progress. Yes, there's crisis. Yes, there's perpetual progress and this and that, and there's perpetual crisis. And how the progress gives rise to crises. Time and time and time again. We all know this one. It's a bit of a paradox, but it's true. And then the crises can give rise to progress from their resolutions or whatever, what they set in train. Of course, we all know this. And you, you can look for the crisis inside the progress and the progress inside the crisis and so on. Um, but I do want to avoid the pan gloss, whether it's Hans Rosling or Hannah Ritchie and, uh, you know, measuring all the, all the ways in which you could say that Hannah Ritchie does, uh, you know, not the end of the world. Uh, uh, that, you know, we're almost approaching peak pollution. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, that's good. We're almost approaching peak pollution. And that's progress. Well, anyway, I don't want to be too harsh. So... I arrive at what I call, uh, for lack of better terms, a historical dialectics of uh, historical capitalism or a historical dialectics of the capitalist modernity. And what, how, what do I think capitalism is? Uh, so capitalism is an inherently self-expansionary system, one that is uh, inherently and perpetually self-destabilizing. The inner drive, the necessity of capital to infinite expansion includes perpetual actions for systemic stabilization and for the expanded reproduction of capital. But that produces perpetual crises. And this, so crises are normality. All through my life, there have been crises. I've written about so many crises. You can look at the titles of the things I've published. The most frequent 
key word will be crisis, you know, crisis of development, crisis of environment, crisis of regimes, crisis of democracy, crisis of hegemony, world system crisis, environmental crisis, climate crisis, every kind of economic, political, social, cult, they're all, it's just ubiquitous. All right, then, crisis is our life. We live in crisis, but that doesn't mean there's no progress or no potentiality for dramatic progress, so defined by whom? By the agents, of course, responding to the structures and the causation of the structures. But yet, all I've said about this self inherently self-destabilizing system, the nature of it, um, it, 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 and yet, all of that, it reproduces itself still, even up to this moment. It makes every effort possible with all capabilities it can command to reproduce itself and perpetuate itself, even when staring in the face of apocalypse. The logic is kind of relentlessly inexorable to self-destabilize self and restabilize and reproduce the system. But what I'm saying is that historical stability a stationary state is not possible in this system. It's impossible. And that, that is a historical analysis. It, it has never been so. It is not possible. And so that only leads to one conclusion, that if you seek historical stability, stationary state, that is only possible in some radically alternative forms and sources of collective social existence our life. That's just logic. And so many people are saying that now, but it's still, you know, inchoate, vague, not what some people are not satisfied that it's not coherent, not a single program. It's not like the 20th century, a world revolution, all power to the state, I'm not going there, right? And that's not unifying the peoples of the world these days, I don't think. Something very different is happening. And yet the message is clear and more and more voices are saying, realizing that, awakening that, that this system is it, as it is, cannot be stabilized. It is perpetual polycrisis. That's its nature, right? And you will experience it if you're in it, the system. So I'm going to end up with a couple of points. One from Franz Fanon, writing in 1961. Let's be frank, we do not believe that the colossal effort which the underdeveloped peoples are called upon to make by their leaders will give the desired results. If conditions of work are not modified, centuries will be needed to humanize this world, which has been forced down to animal level by the imperial powers. The truth is, that we ought not to accept these conditions. We should flatly refuse the situation to which the Western countries wish to condemn us. Uh, he could have said that yesterday. So I, I have I self-identified myself as a protagonist of critical development studies and working with others who identify themselves as being in critical development studies. I've been in many a meeting where we couldn't reach consensus over what critical <laughs> meant, but we are all critical uh, and, and of each other. But I'll, I will define it this way just now. What is critical for me in development studies? It's the attitude of being skeptical always of universal, linear, progressivist narratives and their interpretations of world history and the history we are making in the present. Yeah, that's critical to me, yes? Uh, and the powers that be don't like it because they want to perpetuate the status quo, obviously, or their special interests. Uh, so the last point I want to come to is like the collective. As I said at the beginning, it isn't about me never been about me, and I couldn't have done anything without my colleagues, without my friends, without my family, without the, the help of, of so many others, to which I'm always ever deeply indebted and grateful. 
So our, the knowledge construction is a co-construction of knowledge. You don't independently construct knowledge. You're the product. Your knowledge is the product of even millennia of knowledge and lineages and schools of correspondence and all the mentors you met and friends you made, the books you read, right? Everything is collective. We need to think collectively in our work and act collectively in our work. And always remember that, that, that that's not a luxury or something, or something nice. It's actually the way things are and the way they need to be for effective knowledge creation and its relevance in engaging and responding to the conditions in which we're born and to which we must respond or be complicit in the oppression and suffering they produce. That's what development studies are me. The meaning at the heart of the purpose of development studies has always been that, and I've remembered it in the last few weeks preparing for this. Why did I come into this field? What was it that motivated me? It was that. And you should never let go of that in this field. This field has a moral purpose. So I would end on uh, and how we strive to create the spaces where that can flourish. Where, where an openness, not closing down and saying, I'm going to reproduce my way of thinking in every one of my students, or I am going to insist that I am right and everyone else is stupid and wrong, or I am going to be such an egotist that I don't really care what they think, uh, actually, I just want them to look at me. Forget that. Honestly, if you, if you go that way, you'll suffer. <laughs> it's a law. Oh, so we'll end on these thoughts. Uh, the, the, the one I like quoting the most, uh, to, to, yeah, endlessly, is from Gramsci. And that is, uh, we guide ourselves by pessimism of the intellect, seeing things as they really are. But optimism of the will. Never, ever let go of the optimism of the will. Otherwise, you become a cynic. And the last bastion of reactionaries is cynicism. It's a failure. Then the late, great Tony Benn, who, uh, in Britain, who was born a lord, Tony Wedgwood Benn, and then he, he renounced his lordship, a peerage, and became a lifelong labor activist and kind of revered figure on the broad left, including in the last years of his life. And in one of his final interviews, just before his death, as an old man, he said, all right, each generation must renew the struggle. It happens that you must, you must engage. There will be no escape. Each generation must renew the struggle. There is no final victory. I said, but there is no final defeat. That is the dialectic. Always to be remembered. Never forget agency. Never forget the people. Hmm? Never forget the potentialities in the conjunctures that can go this way or go that way, depending on us. Our life is the creation of our mind. And so finally with Fanon, who finally who said, the struggle, they say, goes on. The people realize that life is an unending contest. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, yeah, you just we're building in the round table, but then I'll okay. have to. All right, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Geos, for uh, setting the, state, the stage um, to discuss development studies through your uh, live uh, changing interventions um, then and even now in your lecture, uh, pointing to uh, synergies uh, between the long durée and the world system, culminating in the very long durée. Um, as you point out, um, this has not only been about you. So at this stage, may I invite 
members of the panel uh, to take these uh, seats next to um, Dr. Huego and me as co-chairs. So, and uh, 